Who here doesn't like to be tickled? I see a lot of hands. Don't like to be tickled. And yet, when your loved one tickles you, you laugh. Why? Tickling is a surprising puzzle for scientists and scholars interested in answering the question, what makes things funny? And I'm going to return to the issue of tickling throughout this talk. First, I want to start with a definition. Let's see if this works. People use you, the word humor in different ways, and I want to define it as I use it in my research. So we define humor as a judgment of something being funny, the experience of amusement, and the tendency to laugh. So there's three components. There's a cognitive component. That's funny. There's an emotional component. These feelings, these positive feelings, sometimes people call it amusement, some, some people call it mirth. And then this behavioral component, the laughter, the smiles, the falling on the ground if, uh, if amused enough. And by your presence here, I already know that you believe that humor is important. Whoops. We'll get to that in a second. But bear with me for a second as I outline some of the ways that it's important. So humor's everywhere. People of all ages and cultures experience humor, humor on a daily basis. Even apes and chimpanzees seem to. And it's part of the earliest social interactions that you have as a baby, laughter. And if you're lucky, it's one of the last things that you're going to do before you die. Humor smooths our social relationships. It eases the sting of criticism. It influences our choices, from the television we watch, the movies we watch, to the people we go out on dates with, to the people we mate with. It's important in our lives. And it clearly makes us happy and helps us cope with stress, pain, and adversity. And none of those reasons brought me here today in front of you. Let me tell you a little bit about this. So I do research in emotion, judgment, and choice. And one of my subfields is in answering a, the question, what makes things wrong? I study moral judgment. And three years ago, I was giving a talk at Tulane University about moral violations, and I was making what might seem to be a fairly simple argument. I was arguing how moral violations cause anger and disgust. And I was using a news report about a church in Tampa, Florida, that was raffling off an H2 Hummer SUV to a lucky member of its congregation who attended its winter retreat. And instead of getting groans, I got laughs, and one professor raised her hand, and she said, Pete, you say that moral violations cause anger and disgust, and yet we're laughing. Why? And I was dumbfounded. I wanted to answer the question of what makes things funny, because I didn't know the answer to the question, what makes things funny. And I started looking around and realized what a messy topic humor is, and how many of the accounts of humor seem to be a little bit messy also. And I don't like messes. So this is a picture of my office. <laughs> I like my nice, tidy stacks, my post-it notes, project, project, project. And this further compelled me. Can we find a nice, tidy, example, or excuse me, definition. So for the next 15 minutes, I'm going to present to you my answer and some evidence from the Humor Research Lab at the University of Colorado. We call ourselves HURL and are dedicated <laughs> to the scientific study of humor. Now, E.B. White has a warning for me. E.B. White said that analyzing humor is like dissecting a frog. 
Few people are interested, and the frog dies. <laughs> Nonetheless, here I am. So Caleb Warren and I, Caleb was a graduate student at the time, have crafted a theory of humor that we call the benign violation theory. And the theory proposes that humor occurs when, and only when, a person perceives a violation, that violation is also perceived to be benign. These perceptions occur simultaneously. We built on work by Tom Veach, who's a linguist, who did a lot of the heavy lifting with this project. And to tell you how hard it is to answer this question, Tom is no longer employed in academia. He's actually working as a plumber now. <laughs> and I've been in touch with him, and he's thrilled to know that his work has spurred spurred this research. So let's look at these conditions. So the first condition is the violation condition. A violation is something that threatens the way you believe the world ought to be. Simply put, something seems wrong or unsettling. So Mark Twain said, the secret source of humor is not joy, but sorrow. There's no humor in heaven. It's rooted in these negative experiences. Now, violations take many forms. It could be violations of social norms, like flatulence, or like June leaving his unmentionables around the house. Or it could be moral violations, like Keith Richards' claim that he snorted, among many other things, his dead father's ashes. And this idea of violations are rooted in many prominent theories of humor. So in psychoanalytic theories that say that humor <laughs> is the release of aggressive or sexual tensions, escaping. Or, or superiority theory, which says that humor occurs when someone is harmed, insulted, or disparaged. And the most prominent theory of humor is incongruity theory that says that humor arises when you expect one thing get something else. Something is surprising. And in this way, each of these theories captures this idea of threat. Now, each of these explanations are a little bit messy. So one is, they tend to ignore evolutionary forms of laughter, like play fighting and tickling. They don't fit very well. They also, while, do, while doing a very good job of explaining what is funny, they do a pretty poor job of explaining what's not funny. So accidentally killing a loved one would be a release of aggressive tendencies, would assert your superiority, and certainly would be inconsistent behavior. But it's hardly a gut buster. And with us, with our theory, you have this additional element of the fact that this violation is benign, is OK in some way. And we've studied three ways that a violation can be seen as benign. One is, you might not be committed strongly to the violated norm, which helps explain why a group of non-religious academics may laugh at a church raffling off an H2 Hummer SUV. Another way that a violation can be benign is if you're psychologically distant from it, if you're far away from it, because it happens to someone else, it happened long ago, or it's just made up. It's just hypothetical in some way. And then the last way that we've looked at this is, is there some alternative explanation that can make this threatening situation OK, as occurs in, for instance, play fighting? Play fighting is a mock attack. It's an attack that's not meant to harm. And both the attacker and the recipient's laughter indicates that it's OK. Things are OK. Now, the theory is helpful because it doesn't just explain what is funny, but it helps explain what's not funny. So you can't play fight with yourself. There's nothing threatening about that situation. Right? It's purely benign. And thus, you don't laugh. These guys might. But generally, <laughs> you don't laugh. You also don't laugh when a play fight turns into a real fight. There's nothing OK about that situation. It's what we call 
a benign, excuse me, a malign violation. It's strictly benign, it's strictly, uh, strictly a violation. Th this holds for other forms of physical humor. Walking down a set of stairs, benign, not funny. Falling down a flight of stairs and being unhurt, benign violation, funny. Falling down a flight of stairs and being badly hurt, malign violation. Now, you may laugh about it weeks, months, years later as you get some distance from that event, and then it can be seen as okay. This also seems to work for puns or violation of, violations of linguistic norms, conventions or rules that also can make sense by way of some other set of rules. How do you make this pun not funny, assuming you thought it was funny to begin with? Well, you could remove the violation, strictly benign. Or you could remove the alternative explanation that makes it OK. This attempt at a pun doesn't make sense. It fails. Let's try another one. This one's just for fun. So I saw this one on a t-shirt in Las Vegas. <laughs> How do you make this uh, violation purely benign? Well, you just move the is, right? You remove the, the violation. You remove the threat from this. How do you make it a malign violation? Strictly offensive. <laughs> you ready? You get the picture, right? So there would be nothing OK in many of your eyes about this. The theory does a nice job, I think, of explaining how uh, humorous experiences often arouse mixed emotions, things like nervous laughter. Because a violation is necessary for humor, you may experience the negative emotions caused by that violation in addition to amusement which ex helps explain why tickling, on one hand, you don't like it, on the other hand, you're laughing. And also explains uh, our participants' reactions to things like benign moral violations, such as when someone's treated unfairly, but probably deserves it. So the dumb American who visits the, uh, this, this store at the US-Mexico border not only probably deserves to pay the extra dollar, but probably can afford to pay the extra dollar in this sense. How do you make this not funny? Well, you could remove the violation, treat people fairly and equally, or you can make it a malign violation and take advantage of the less advantaged group in this case. The theory also addresses this idea of psychological distance. And this is not a new concept. Comedians, writers, and directors have long known that distance can help transform tragedy into comedy. So Mark, one of Mark Twain's famous quips is that, you know, that humor is tragedy plus time. This can take many forms and also explains why much of the very good comedic television these days that features very severe violations is in hypothetical format, is a cartoon just like this South Park episode. So for those of you over there, this is the, um, the clue is people who annoy you. And I hope I don't have to explain it to you, but the answer is naggers. Naggers annoy you. <laughs> but the theory makes an interesting prediction. It doesn't say that distance makes everything funnier. So in the case of our studies, we find that our participants will say that getting hit by a car five years ago is a lot funnier than getting hit by a car yesterday. But what about a very mild mishap, a mild violation? Well, stumbling on a curb five years ago is just purely benign. It's not even worth your attention, let alone your laughter. And in some ways, bringing mild violations closer may actually help make them funnier. So what are the implications for you for enjoying more humor in your life? Are there, are there lessons, are there implications that can be meaningful from this small set of principles? 
Well, one is, it says, understand your audience. So the theory does a nice job of explaining the huge individual and cultural differences with regard to humor, because it's a, percep a perceptual process. What one person sees as benign, another sees as a benign violation, and yet another sees as a malign violation. And so you have to know what is threatening, what is okay. So I had this experience firsthand. I actually tried my hand at stand-up. So I, uh, you know, I I want, I'm gonna live what, I, what I'm learning. And so I went to the toughest room in Denver. It's the Squire Lounge. It's, it wins Dive Bar every year, uh, best dive bar every year, and Tuesdays they have open mic night. And I prepared a routine, I showed up. I was dressed a lot like this. I was the only person who was dressed like this. And the, the would-be comedians in, ahead of me, the topics of their routines were like, telling stories about accidentally smoking crack. They were telling jokes about slavery, jokes about abortions, and they were getting big laughs. My routine was about nicknames. I got three laughs. One was unintended. Uh, and my, my entire approach was much too benign for this group. I would have had to ratchet it up about tenfold to get any real laughs. And I was pre-tenure at the time. And so I would have basically put my career in jeopardy to get a few laughs at the Squire. <laughs> Related to that, it also says something about understanding the situation. Is the situation that you're facing a violation? Is there something wrong? Well then, there, the, um, the lesson's simple. Find a way to make it okay. So Sarah Silverman creates really offensive, upsetting situations, and she manages to make it okay in some way by being sort of cute and not serious and non-threatening about the things that she says. Politicians say those things, they get fired. So we call this the Silverman strategy by making a violation benign. But let's suppose it's a regular, everyday situation, normal. Nothing wrong or threatening about it. Kind of like a show about nothing. The everyday life that we have, you can employ the Seinfeld strategy. So the Seinfeld strategy points out the things that are wrong. That's a coincidence. <laughs> That's good, you're using the Seinfeld strategy right now. This works, I told you this can work. And then finally, you want to understand yourself. Are you like Sarah Silverman, brash and over the top and have a tendency to say the wrong thing at the wrong time? Well then, concentrate on making these offensive violations okay in some way. Or are you like Seinfeld, more mild-mannered, more meek? Well then, you've got to risk things. You've got to challenge yourself to put things out there that might be a little bit uncomfortable. So returning to this issue of tickling. Oh. How is tickling a benign violation? It's this mock attack. We both experience the amusement when our loved ones do it, but also the discomfort of being attacked there. When is it benign? When does it not elicit laughter? When you try to tickle yourself. There's nothing threatening about that situation. And if on your way home tonight, some creepy guy in a trench coat comes up behind you and tries to tickle you, will you laugh? Hopefully not. Hopefully you will run away or punch the guy. It's purely malign in that case. Now you can laugh now because it's hypothetical, right? You have that distance away from it. So now of course, this idea of creating benign violations is easier said than done. Um, Irma Bombeck said that there's a thin line uh, between laughter and pain, comedy and tragedy, and humor and hurt. 
Thank you very much.